I look at that and say, what the hell is going on there? I love the commentary. I love it. So um, I poo-poo on it. <laughs> Hey everyone, Teddy Baldessar here, back with my friend Kevin. So great Kevin, to be here. Teddy, great, great to see to, you again. Yeah. Every single time we do a video, all the comments are, I love what these guys are doing videos together. We need more of it. <laughs> so we actually have some different content slated up for all of you guys. We have one planned here, many others throughout the year. So after this video, definitely go over to your channel as well so that you can follow along on Kevin's channel because we have a ton of different escapades going on. So definitely go over there. Yeah, my base loves it too, Teddy. They're, I'm getting rave reviews of the stuff we do together. So let's keep doing it. I love it. Yeah. I, I don't need any encouragement for that. So today what we have planned for this video, now I don't know what you've seen yet. I'm sure you're familiar with some of these, but I wanted to get your first kind of take reaction on some of these new releases that have been rolled out in 2021 from a lot of the leading brands. Just sure. some of them. Just going to yeah. go through and just kind of get your gut take on what you're thinking about some of these new releases. Well, we you know, Teddy, I, I, I stay pretty au courant, as they say, so <laughs> I'm probably just going to blow you away. Well, your commentary is always top class, so let's right. just go through it. So the first one's from Rolex. Now, yeah. most of the discussion for Rolex this year was around the Explorers, yeah. and for good reason. We saw new Explorer 1s. Um, we also saw some new Explorer 2s. And Those highly were... anticipated, I might add. Yes. I mean, they're, they're very good, Rolex, at leaking what's coming so that everybody goes crazy. And when they finally release it, there's a huge amount of pent-up demand. It's a very smart marketing strategy. No one's ever accused them of being bad marketers, that's for sure. That is 100% true. Yeah. All right, Kevin, so for the first watch that Rolex released this year, at least the first one we'll touch on, is the new Rolex Explorer. Now, just some context with this one. It looks very familiar. Yeah. The talking point here, though, is 39 millimeters, dropped it down to 36 millimeters. Yeah, so let me tell you what's going on there. You probably know this as well, Teddy, but all of a sudden, smaller dials on men's wrists, wrists are smoking hot. I mean, it is, it's almost a fashion trend. And everybody's scrambling from their Monster 44s and everything else to try and dial down. And the guy that caught this first, if you remember that micro brand Ming, Ming yep, was sure. almost two years ahead when he started coming out with tiny dials. People said, what is this? Why don't we get the mega dial here, Ming? He said, I'm going to where, I'm skating to where the puck is going, not where it is right now. And he was right. I, myself, for what I like in mean, a watch, I'm small wrist. I mean, I'm wearing a 38 millimeter watch right now. Like, there's, yeah. I have smaller wrists, and that's kind of what I go for. But I always say Muhammad Ali was wearing a Cartier tank. So if he's wearing that back in the day, yeah. I think we can all wear some smaller watches. Yeah, it's true. And I, but I think, you know, I remember, um, the president of Patek US telling me once about metals, and I think the same thing goes with watch dial sizes. He said that in his career of almost 45 years in the watch industry, he's watched every metal get hot for four or five years. Gold, you know, pink gold, white gold, platinum, back to steel, like a constant ebb and flow within collectors mm -hmm. in terms of what they wanted and what icons were wearing. And so all of a sudden, if you're a real trendsetter like Muhammad Ali was, he goes for a tiny you know, bracelet watch and it blows wide open. So you're a fan of the 36, shifting back I, I, down? I'm not against it at all. I, I, would, I would say that you know, th this, is a, this is the ultimate classic, if you think about it, from the explorer days of Mount Everest. I mean, mm -hmm. that's where this look really started to be advertised by Rolex way back. And this is the DNA, even if you look at early Submariner references, this type of DNA was so paramount in all the creations that would come from Rolex next. It really is that cornerstone of a yeah. sports watch and they kind of built upon it but following it. This bezel is so iconic, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it really says Explorer, right? That whole case, that silhouette, it's yeah. recognizable in so many just images. So I think that's going to be immensely popular watch. So the other uh, news around the Explorer was it did come out in two-tone. Now this one was a little bit more polarizing. What's your take on that? Don't like it. Don't like it? Why is that? You know, it, it, the Explorer is not a two-tone watch. It just, it, it shouldn't be. This is travesty. This is a sin that's going on here. And, and, and I, I, you know, it may be popular, but this takes away from the iconic brand. I, I just, I wouldn't touch that thing. I mean. I bet it, it does not appreciate as much as the classic. That's what I think. I mean, there are certain Rolexes that make sense in a two-tone that have been always two-tone and people are used to it. I look at that and say, what the hell is going on there? Who made that mistake? <laughs> I love the commentary. I love it. Now, let's see. Let's go to the Rolex new Explorer 2. Now, yeah. this is very familiar. Pretty much the 
only change here for the most part. They did mention that the lugs are slightly different, but mostly the movements. So you're getting the new generations of movements. I'm a huge Explorer 2 advocate. Yeah. I love this line. I think it's one of the most overlooked models that Rolex makes. But you know, in general, what's your thoughts on this new release? Uh, this is 50 years as well. So yeah. you know, that's kind of what was being marked here, 1971, the original release. It's a classic. There's no question. Now I've already seen this piece, and my um, and I spoke to my representative about it. I was very disappointed that this dial was not red, because I think against the, the, the hand. You're talking about the hand. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, it, to me, it should have been red because it would have done a perfect, um, you know, blend with the black numerals on the bezel, and and you know, it would have matched up here with the lettering. So it, I own a 16570. It's the one with the red, you know, tip GMT hand. Which exactly. It's my favorite. It's 40 millimeters. I love the wearing dimension. So that's still my personal favorite. I don't know if we're done here yet. It's a 50 year anniversary. It's so strange that Rolex would not do something more. So I don't know what they have in store, but it just seems like this is a little anticlimactic for what we may have anticipated. Or go right off the deep end with green, which is the classic Rolex color. But mm -hmm. I just don't like this orange, this burnt orange. I mean, it just doesn't do it for me. And I would not buy that piece for that reason. This does not work. So um, I poo poo on it. All right, okay. I love it. We got opinions coming in hot. Now we're going to move on to another brand that I think did a very good job this year. Um, Breitling is going through a lot of different changes, but this year they released quite a few different models. So to me, this was the standout. This is the B, yeah. new, new B09. So this yeah. is a manual caliber coming off their other premier collection, but they described that as a pistachio green dial. Green yeah. is on trend right now. Uh, yes, it is on trend, and I worry that that's all it is. It's just a hot flame in the pan. It's, it's a crepe flambe. Um, I'm not sure that that is a great investment. But what about just the dial and what it's going for? I know, for? but I mean, you know, for me, I'm just saying, you're asking what I think. I yeah. like the dial, but mm -hmm. for me, that is a flash in the pan. Catch the green trend. Everybody's talking about the green. You know, Patek threw out that green piece uh, on the 5711 mm -hmm. when they oh, yeah, can't. It's, it's All that, and that's really why these guys are chasing it. That's my okay. view. All right, okay, honest take. Let's go on to this. Now, this was by far the most polarizing watch released at yeah, yeah. <laughs> in now, the last I, like several months. So yeah. I want to hear your take on this because there's you talk about appreciation. I mean, two, it's limited to 250 pieces, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but this definitely got some pushback. What is your initial so, thoughts? So um, what what I'm liking about the brand and what they're doing when they brought out the 1159, they got the same flack. Remember? It's huge. Huge. huge pushback. They made a huge, big release, and but but who was the down. first to buy the perpetual? Me. That's my favorite of the collection. Yeah, it, it, was, it and it, it has appreciated. It initially didn't do anything, and then all of a sudden it got hot when people started to realize the beauty of that dial, how beautiful it was, and and everybody was freaking out. Oh, it's not the Royal Oak. It doesn't have the Royal Oak, you know, symmetry and all that. But it, they snuck in that symmetry underneath the round dial if you really look at the case. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. point was. With this maker, with AP and Francois and the and and the the you know he's almost exploring new directions, and I appreciate him for that. I endorse this piece. Hmm. Now, it's purple is not my favorite color. Had this been fire engine red, I'd be all over it, because it's it, they're going right after Richard Mille with this. That's what's going on here. That's what they're doing. They're going after that limited kind of skeleton look, crazy uh, dial. But this is this is going to be a good collector's piece. I mean, it's going to appreciate. I think it's going to appreciate just given the limited production, and it created a stir that transcends the community of watches. Whenever you can do that in the industry of watches, that just gets out to the rank, regular public and can just be pop culture. Yeah. This watch did it. I mean, maybe it's the affiliation with the movie, whatever it was. It did strike a chord there. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the community, there was a lot of pushback, but. Well, From a it, business it, decision, I don't think you or I are going to debate that it's no, probably a good move. No, but I mean, the question is, is it, does it have heritage to Royal Oak? Yes, you can see it, right? Yes, in the, in the case architecture, yes, but you as you get to the, the dial, I mean... You can see the screws, you can see the screws. Forget yes. the dial, I'm just okay. saying, when you yeah, look, sure. on, you know, catching the silhouette on the wrist, you're yep. going to say, oh, that's an AP. For sure. And For so, sure. you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. Purple is just not my thing. Um, and again, if that been red, it'd be on my wrist right now. I'm very intrigued by how you are reacting to some of these. You're going in a direction that I thought was for some, but in other ways you're not. So it's good to see. All right, so Kevin, the next brand I want to look at is Cartier. And I want to look at the new 
Cloche. So these watches, in terms of, we're talking about silhouette a lot. Right, right. I mean, these are probably these the are most- These are not limited edition. But in terms of price around high 20s to yeah. 30s, depending on the material, yeah. uh, but the design- I think this is 25, dark face. Yeah, you're in that kind of range, yeah. high 20s, early, you know, low 30s. What's your take on these? So I have been considering uh, the gold dark face, but I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little, I'm, you know, this is an on the fence purchase. Okay. It's, it's going to be a striking piece on your wrist. There's no question. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's got a vintage look to it. 100%. You know, the thing is, Teddy, you have to admit, dress watches are not hot right now. No, they're not. What, what do you see for the future of dress watches? Because I could see a comeback. I could see, the steel sports kick is it's relentless well, right it's now. It's been crazy. going on for seven years. So I don't know how this is going to do. Um, it's, it's a difficult watch to gift somebody because it's so out there. They may not like it. I think it's a personal preference. It is a dress watch. And for me, I'm just not feeling the, um, not feeling the love. Not feeling the love, all right. Yeah. Okay, we'll keep it going. Now let's go to Omega. So now they did have all the Tokyo editions, but the new, more production release that they had this year was the new Seamaster 300. Very now, hot. I love this watch. Yeah. The, they had the Diver 300s, which have kind of been a mainstay. You had the helium escape valve, and yeah. that was kind of the Pierce Brosnan era, merged from the 90s. Right. That's the Bond watch. Yeah. But then you have these, which are don't maybe necessarily get the same amount of love, um, mm -hmm. but I think it's more true to the original 1957 It's design. very interesting that you bring up Omega, because for the last, uh, I don't know, six, seven years, I have really ignored the brand. Hmm. And I'm now coming back because my very first piece was the Moonwatch, hmm. back in the 60s. That's the first watch I ever wanted. I mean, it, you know, Omega was really amazing to attach themselves to NASA and the whole, you know, chase for the moon landing. That whole thing became part of its DNA. And that look and style is, is worldwide and known. Collectors like me are adding uh, to our collections now. I'm, I'm getting the Snoopy. Um, there's a couple of pieces that we're probably gonna see here that I'm gonna be buying. They're not crazy expensive, they're well made. The coaxials and what they've done, the, the quartz crisis, if we're talking about who was the hardest on when it really was at the peak, I mean, Omega definitely got hurt, you know, they got beat up quite a bit, but ever since the adoption of, you know, the, they had the bond wash era and then the adoption of the coaxials from Dr. George Daniels, the brand I think has really kind of reinvented themselves in the 21st century and yeah. in the last, I would say five years, it's interesting from the brand dynamics or the industry dynamics where they're positioned now as a brand that has this incredible heritage and history. I mean, only matched by, I would say, Rolex in terms of yep. mass market luxury sports watches. And then you're dealing it with a value for money standpoint when you have that conversation. It's compelling. Yeah, I, I think we both agree. The brand is, is, is moving up, not down. And, um, the, and the, they're doing some great work with dials. This is a beautiful piece. I mean, there's no question about it. This gold and blue and black, I mean, these, these burnt colors are gorgeous. Uh, it works well in steel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I would buy that watch. That's a good piece. All right, cool. Okay, so now we've been talking a lot about green dials. Let's just look at this one, because I think this was probably the talk of the town in some ways. 5711 yeah. now has been shifted over to the green dial. What, what are your thoughts on well, this? Well, so first of all, I'm very thankful because I have a 5711 original. It doubled in value that day. That's basically what happened. I've never seen appreciation like that. They're trading Crazy. for 110 grand or something right now. It's insanity. It is insanity. I'm glad I have it. Do I like this piece? Yes, I do. I do. I really do. So um, you were very against some other green dials. What yeah, makes but, you but say this is okay? It, because it, it immediately became one, maybe the most sought after steel watch in the world, this piece. This one, this specific piece. It wasn't even debated amongst collectors. Everybody said yes, they could get one and has already ordered one. And the, the demand is insane for this watch. The demand came from the United Arab Emirates. It came from Saudi Arabia, came from Japan, all over Asia, all over North America. It's, very often they bring up these pieces and they're only hot in certain geographies. This is smoking hot all around the world. That is, that's the hottest watch in the world right now. Yeah, it's hard to debate. But, so you're a fan. You're oh, a fan huge, of the huge, Okay, huge, all right. Huge. Okay, I figured you would be. Okay, so let's now let's get into maybe some different type of watchmaking. Um, we'll do a final two watches. So one American 1921. I know you you have the. I have this piece. 
Yeah, this is the this is now they have it in white gold. Yeah, you have the platinum, right? With the, the platinum. with the blue I'm, numerals. I'm, I'm happy with my platinum. I prefer platinum in this mm -hmm. piece because it's very, very, very classic. They really haven't changed the caliber since they brought it to market. It's it's. I mean, they've upgraded it mm -hmm. obviously, but they've left a lot of the original characteristics identical. So, I mean, do you, you like the 1921, though, like the design? I mean, does this catch, I mean, for you, like how? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. But I bought it more. Actually, I bought it with you, yes, Teddy. Yes, I remember. Uh, I bought it for a television piece, and I have worn it multiple times on various shows, and everybody talks about, what's wrong with that watch? Why is it off, you know, axis? And I said, it's not off axis. You know, it's the same conversation, which is why I bought it. It's fun. Um, but it is not appreciated by everybody. Mm -hmm. But I will say one thing about it. Women like this watch. Women wear this watch. There's a 36 millimeter option as exactly. well to accompany it. So I know many women, um, including some that are close friends of my wife, that saw mine and got their husbands to buy them this or they bought it themselves. And that's very interesting because you see that kind of trend occur on really classic watches like a Daytona, mm -hmm. a Rolex Daytona. You see them on the wrists of women all over the place. This is happening professional as well. With this I love the blurring of the lines that we're seeing between like who can really take ownership and wear a watch now. I think yeah. anybody can really just you know wear. And these are one of these select models that I think looks great on anybody's wrist. Uh, and creates that conversation. Now, the last watch we're going to look at is the new, probably the, probably the biggest release in terms of uh, watchmaking chops yeah. uh, this year, I would say. And this is with the new caliber 185 from JLC. So this, a four-sided watch, yeah. four-sided watch, has crazy different functions. Um, you know. I believe 11 different complications on yeah. this. Have um, you put this on your wrist yet? I, I have not. I have not put yeah. this on my wrist yet, but. I mean, talking minute repeaters, flying tourbillons, yeah, perpetual yeah, calendar, yeah. pretty crazy. Uh, yeah. There's also on the back chassis. So you know, on your like, on, you have a, I think you have a dual face. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Like you have, of course, the flip side of the case. Right. But this, on the actual chassis itself, there's also two additional faces. Yeah. So on the back of the steel chassis, and then on the reverse. So, so that you know, really, what they're doing here is going after the Uber collector. That's what's going on. If you, if I was having to guess on this piece 10 years from now in terms of its value, I would guess that it would appreciate. It really is a beautiful piece of work. It's crazy too, because when you're talking about such limited numbers of yeah. production, I mean, it takes a small crowd to change the whole game. Yeah. Right? It's, an, it's incredible. I mean, I think this was like 11, yeah, I mean, we're talking total amount production, 10 pieces worldwide, I think. Yeah, 10, but, but 10, the, 10 you, you, you have to go to the collectors up front before you go and produce this stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got to find 10 buyers. There's other places I put a million bucks first okay. before this. Yeah. That's fair enough. There's, there's a lot of places you can put a million bucks. So in general, just to recap, I mean, was there just one standout watch for this year that was like, that was it? I, I'm sorry, but it has to be the Patek green face. 5711. Yeah. You know, it, the funny thing is, Teddy, you know if you walk in a room with that piece, it's going to be the envy of everybody's wrist. I mean, it's just everybody's going to want that piece. It's a beautiful piece. It's got the heritage. It's got, you know, it's already got the 5711 guaranteed appreciation from the investment side of it. And it's beautiful. I mean, yeah, I mean, if I, if, if I could only have one of today's discussion, that would be the watch. Hmm. That's it. Fair enough. Well, all right, guys, that is the conclusion of this video. If you guys did enjoy it and you want to see more of this in the future, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell icon. Also, go check out Kevin's channel as well because we're going to be doing some content over there in addition to what we're doing here. Also, teddyballstar.com, full authorized dealer of over 30 brands. Definitely go check out that as well. But, guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well. See you next time. <laughs>